Good morning. As Dick has mentioned, I am Chet Crocker, the former chair. Um, delighted at the opportunity to be with you and to have the chance as a member still of the Board of Directors uh, to um, be with you in this great conference here this morning. William Perry served as America's 19th Secretary of Defense from 1994 to 1997 and prior to that as Deputy Secretary of Defense. Bill Perry is an extraordinary public servant. He served as a member of the Iraq Study Group sponsored by the Institute of Peace and he is currently serving as a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University. Bill Perry is a leading national and international voice on nuclear issues. He also chairs the Strategic Posture Review Commission being convened by the U.S. Institute of Peace. So I would like to invite Bill and the panel that will be speaking directly after Bill to come up to the podium, please, and make his remarks. And would the panel members please join as well? Thank you. In many countries of the world, the transfer of power is occasioned by mob violence or army takeovers. So I find it inspiring that the transfer of power in our great democracy can be symbolized by passing the baton. Please join me in a big round of applause for the United States Institute for Peace for organizing this session on passing the baton. Dick, Robin. God knows the Obama administration will find that baton to be loaded with intractable problems, a financial crisis, an automobile industry on the rocks, a growing unemployment problem, and the Mideast in turmoil to name only the problems getting the largest headlines today. But I'm going to focus my comments on the growing nuclear danger, which does not receive headlines, but which I believe is the gravest security problem facing the United States. I'm going to open my discussion with some personal comments about why I decided to join George Shultz, Henry Kissinger, and Sam Nunn in the nuclear security project, which was a kicked off in the first place by two different op-eds in the Wall Street Journal. This project is dedicated to alerting the world to the increasing danger from nuclear weapons and to laying out a program for reducing that danger. In particular, I will answer a question that I and George and Henry and Sam have all each been asked in this last year. Why is an old cold warrior like you palling around with nuclear abolitionists? Well, I'm driven, first of all, by a strong belief that the gravest danger our nation faces today is a terror group detonating a nuclear bomb in one of our cities. But secondly, I must acknowledge that my experiences as a Cold Warrior have, in fact, conditioned me to be especially sensitive about the dangers of nuclear weapons. Let me share two of those experiences with you. Very early in my career, when I was a scientist at an electronics laboratory in California, I received a phone call from a Stanford classmate, Bud Whelan, who at the time was the CIA's Deputy Director for Science and Technology. He asked me to come back to Washington to consult with him on a technical problem. I said, sure. I'll rearrange my schedule and come back and see you next week. And he said, you don't understand. I want to talk to you right away. So I took the red eye to Washington and met with him the following morning. I was stunned when he showed me U-2 pictures revealing a Soviet missile deployment underway in Cuba. For the next 13 days, I was part of a small team that worked every night studying the latest technical intelligence available so that President Kennedy had the benefit of that analysis the following morning. Every day when I went to the analysis center, I believed would be my last day on Earth. And to this day, 
I believe that we avoided a nuclear catastrophe as much by good luck as by good management. The second experience occurred 16 years later when I was the Under Secretary of Defense for Research and Engineering. One night I was awoken by a phone call at 3 o'clock in the morning, and as I sleepily picked up the phone, I heard a voice identifying himself as the watch officer at the North American Air Defense Command. The general got right to the point, telling me that his computers were indicating 200 ICBMs on the way from the Soviet Union to the United States. I immediately awoke. That was, of course, a false alarm. The general was calling me in the hopes that I could help him determine what had gone wrong so that he had some answers when he briefed the president the next morning. That call is engraven in my memory, but it is only one of three false alarms that occurred in the United States during that period, and I don't know how many more might have occurred in the Soviet Union. So the risks of a nuclear catastrophe were never, were never academic to me. Ironically, during that same period, same period that I was awoken by the false alarm call, I was responsible for the development of our country's nuclear weapons. During my tenure, I oversaw the development of the B-2 bomber, the MX missile, the Trident submarine, the Trident missile, the air launch cruise missile, the ground launch cruise missile, and the sea launch cruise missile. So I really am a card-carrying cold warrior. But while I saw the risks in building these deadly weapons, I believed that they were necessary given the very real threats that we faced during the Cold War. However, after the Cold War ended, I believed that it was no longer necessary to take those terrible risks. And I believe that we should begin to dismantle the deadly nuclear legacy of the Cold War. My first opportunity to act on this belief came in 1994 when I was asked by President Clinton to be Secretary of Defense. As Secretary, my first priority was to work to reduce the dangers of the Cold War nuclear arsenal. Our greatest immediate danger was that the nuclear weapons in Ukraine, Kazakhstan, and Belarus would fall into the hands of terrorists. When the Soviet Union collapsed, these new republics had inherited the nuclear weapons that had been on their soil. Ukraine, for example, had more nuclear weapons at that time than China, France, and the United Kingdom combined. And the country was going through great social, economic, and political turbulence. Through an act of great statesmanship on the part of the leaders of those three countries, we were able to get them to agree to give up their nuclear weapons. And then using the Nunn Lugar program, we assisted them in the dismantlement process. How that happened is an interesting and instructive story, but not one which I will be telling you at this time. I will, however, summarize the dramatic results. During my time in office, I oversaw the dismantlement of almost 10,000 nuclear weapons in the United States and in the former Soviet Union, and helped three nations, Kazakhstan, Belarus, and Ukraine, to go from nuclear to non-nuclear. This was the first time since the dawn of the nuclear age that nuclear proliferation had actually been reversed. Also in my last year in office, I steered the test ban treaty through the Pentagon so that President Clinton could sign it. At the time, I believed that we were well on our way to mitigating the deadly nuclear legacy of the Cold War. But since then, the effort has stalled and even reversed. The United States has never ratified the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, now 12 years after we signed it. Russia and China have begun the development of new nuclear weapons. In shades of the Cold War, Russia is now threatening to base nuclear missiles in Kaliningrad. India and Pakistan have gone nuclear. AQ Khan has sold nuclear technology to an unknown number of countries. 
North Korea built and tested nuclear weapons, and Iran is on the same path. If Iran and North Korea cannot be contained, we are facing a real danger of a cascade of proliferation. Indeed, I believe that today we are truly at a tipping point of nuclear proliferation. And if the world does tip, it will be irreversible and dangerous beyond the imagination of most people. My colleague Sam Nunn has said, the world is in a race between catastrophe and cooperation. True enough, but in fact, we are not racing. Indeed, the world has been moving backwards in nuclear proliferation this past decade. Some of us have been sounding the alarm, but no one is heeding it. And each year, we have moved ever closer to a nuclear catastrophe. I've gone through this background to explain my state of mind just over two years ago when George Shultz decided to hold a workshop at Stanford on the 20th anniversary of the Reykjavik summit. At the end of that workshop, we concluded that we ought to revive the idea that Reagan and Gorbachev had discussed at that meeting, namely starting to, to move towards the elimination of nuclear weapons. We believed that some really dramatic position was needed to stop this terrible drift to a nuclear catastrophe. And there followed two op-eds by the four of us in January of 07 and January of 08. Since then, we have finished visited leaders and former leaders all around the world to rally support. London in February of 08, Delhi and Shanghai in October, Moscow in December, and this year we are scheduling additional meetings. To be sure, these unofficial or track two efforts have stirred a global discussion on the issue. But in fact, no real actions will happen unless the governments begin to take it seriously. And that will not happen, I believe, until the American government takes a strong leadership position. President-elect Obama took a strong position on this issue during his campaign when he said, quote, it is time to send a clear message. America seeks a world with no nuclear weapons. But as long as nuclear weapons exist, we must retain a strong deterrent. I am wholly in accord with both of those positions. And I believe that there are specific actions that President Obama can take to move us in the direction of a world with no nuclear weapons. He could use the bully pulpit of the presidency to awaken the world to the incredible danger of nuclear weapons. And I believe that President Obama would be especially effective in that role. He could invite Russia to negotiate a new treaty entailing significant nuclear arms reductions. He could seek a return to deep cooperation between Russia and the United States in mitigating the dangers of nuclear terrorism. He could work with the Senate for the ratification of the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, now 12 years after we signed it. He could program and he could propose a new fissile material cutoff treaty to include verification procedures. And he could support the International Atomic Energy Agency in its efforts to strengthen the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. All of these steps could be started in the first year of his administration. Any of them would make us safer. Harder to do, but even more important, he must deal effectively with North Korea and Iran's nuclear weapons program. I believe that North Korea's production of plutonium and subsequent nuclear tests to be the most dangerous development since the end of the Cold War. But I also believe it still can be dealt with with diplomacy. However, I am not so confident about our ability to deal with the nuclear weapon program in Iran. The European Union has been negotiating with, it, with Iran to try to get them to forswear enriching their uranium. But these talks seem to be going nowhere. 
The United States is clearly a very interested party in these negotiations, but has declined to join them. So my forecast is that with the present weak negotiating strategies, Iran is moving inexorably towards becoming a nuclear power. And it seems clear that Israel will not sit by idly while Iran takes the final steps towards becoming a nuclear power. As a result, President Obama will almost certainly face a serious crisis with Iran. Indeed, I believe that the crisis point will be reached in his first year in office. So on the nuclear front, President Obama will face a daunting set of problems, none of which can be solved unilaterally. And I don't need to tell you how difficult it will be to get the needed international cooperation. Our relations with Russia, for example, are at an all-time low. My recent visit to Russia verified just how low. But it also offered some hope that the United States-Russian relations can take a positive turn with the new administration. Although I must say, this is a hope, not a certainty. I would sum up my feelings about our nuclear security project after two years of effort as follows. Based on the global responses we have gotten to date, I am encouraged to believe that we are on a positive track. More than a century ago, Victor Hugo wrote, more powerful than the tread of mighty armies is an idea whose time has come. I believe that containing the deadly nuclear legacy of the Cold War is an idea whose time has finally come. But I also believe that it will take decades to achieve the final goals of that project and much hard work. And that long time scale has two ramifications. First, until we approach that goal, nuclear powers will still feel obliged to maintain an appropriate level of deterrence forces. And those forces must be constituted to have acceptable levels of reliability, safety, and security. I am chairing a congressional commission that is examining what actions the United States should take to maintain our deterrence forces without signaling to other nations that we are trying to rebuild those forces. Our interim report was sent to the Congress last month, and our final recommendations will go to the new Congress and the new administration in a few months. The good news in our interim report is that the stockpile stewardship program and the life extension programs carried on by the nuclear laboratories have been outstanding successes, and our nuclear weapons capability remains robust. The bad news is that support seems to be wavering for those programs and for the scientists who make them possible. A second ramification of this long time scale is that we must be training a new generation of security specialists to carry on the task as the generation of cold warriors retires from the scene. All of the members of our nuclear security project are in their 70s or 80s. And friends ask us why are we are still working on security projects. But in fact, I work every day at Stanford with young security specialists. And when I retire from the scene, I will happily pass the baton to them, as well as the young security scholars at other universities and institutions such as the U.S. Institute for Peace. But I'm not ready to retire from the scene just yet. I hope that my brief comments have answered the question with which I started the talk, why I am involved in this program. But that leaves the question of why I'm still taking red eyes to Washington and making extended trips to Delhi, Moscow, and Beijing instead of enjoying my golden years in some peaceful grove. I will answer that second question by noting that having helped build our nuclear arsenal, I believe that I have a special responsibility to help dismantle it. Indeed, I want to express this thought by using the words of Robert Frost. The woods are lovely 
dark and deep. But I have promises to keep and miles to go before I sleep and miles to go before I sleep. Thank you. Bill, we thank you very much for those <clears throat> inspiring and uplifting words. My job here is to uh, introduce very briefly a panel of uh, younger security specialists, uh, perhaps. Are we all younger? Yes, we're all younger. To make a few comments on some of the proliferation challenges that uh, you have outlined, and perhaps uh, some additional ones, and to address uh, some of the diplomatic initiatives and tools for trying to cope with the challenges that you have so eloquently uh, discussed and, and put before us. Uh, my other job is to have a hook and to make certain that we stay more or less on time, so I will do my best uh, to do that. And I'm going to introduce the panelists and ask them to speak in alphabetical order. So we start with Eric Edelman, who is winding up his tour most recently as Under Secretary of Defense for for policy at the Defense Department. Uh, he will be followed by Bob Joseph, who served as Under Secretary of State for Arms Control and International Security in the State Department, and uh, is still a special envoy for nuclear proliferation. Bob will be followed by Dan Poneman, who is a senior fellow at the Forum for International Policy and served as Special Assistant and Senior Director on the NSC staff uh, during the Clinton administration. And playing cleanup is Wendy Sherman, who is a principal at the Albright Group a former counselor and coordinator for North Korea policy at the uh, State Department. Wendy, of course, is also involved in the Obama transition. So she will tell us what the Obama administration, in fact, is going to do. Um, over to you, Eric. Chet, thank you very much. And uh, I'm delighted to be here today, um, and particularly to be able to be on, on a panel with um, so many of my former colleagues from government and administrations of both parties who've devoted so much time to this incredibly important problem and to be on the, the dais with uh, one of my many former bosses, Bill Perry. Um, I've been feeling increasingly superfluous uh, over the last few days as I wind down. I think I now have seven more days left uh, in the office. Um, and I feel even more superfluous on this panel after hearing uh, Bill's excellent uh, remarks. But I, I thought I would talk a little bit about what I think is becoming a bipartisan consensus and a basis that the new administration uh, can build on to deal with some of the problems Bill discussed. And I quite agree with his description of many of the problems. And a lot of that bipartisan basis has been articulated uh, in the reports of several uh, recent commissions. Uh, now, I have to confess that I've had a somewhat during the course of my 30-year government career, cynical view of commissions by former government officials uh, instructing those of us still in office about what we ought to be doing. But as I approach the end of my 30-year career, I've begun to appreciate more of the, uh, the uh, wisdom, utility, and insight that former officials might be able to offer <laughs> incumbents. Uh, and so I've taken these three uh, recent commission reports actually very seriously. One of them is one that Wendy Sherman served on with distinction, the Graham Talent uh, Commission Report, World at Risk on Combating Proliferation and WMD Terrorism. The other is the coates Rob Report, Meeting the Challenge on the uh, Iranian Nuclear Program. And then finally, there is the uh, USIP supported and congressionally mandated strategic posture commission that Secretary Perry chairs that he referred to whose interim report has been released to the Congress and which he described which has uh, former Secretary Jim Schlesinger as the vice chair. And I think there is a consensus in all of these reports uh, as well as uh, in the speech that the National Security Advisor Steve Hadley made yesterday um, at uh, I think it was CSIS <clears throat> and also in the deliberations of the Defense Policy Board, uh, which both Bob Joseph and, and Bill Perry sit on, that uh, two of the most urgent problems that the new administration will face will be the um, nuclear weapons programs of North Korea and Iran, what can be done to stop them, 
uh, and the prospect, uh, as Bill suggested, that there could be, that we're at a tipping point and that there could be a cascade of new nuclear uh, powers. Um, the Graham Talent Commission said that stopping these programs should be a top priority for the new administration and urged that the diplomatic engagement that will be required to do that, quote, should be from a position of strength, emphasizing both the benefits to those countries of abandoning their nuclear weapons programs and the enormous costs of failing to do so. Such engagement must be backed by the credible threat of direct action in the event that diplomacy fails. I, I quite agree with that. The coates rob Commission painted a picture of what the consequences of a nuclear-armed Iran might mean. They described a nuclear-ready, and I would stress, by the way, nuclear-ready is almost as big a challenge as nuclear-armed. Islamic Republic, ruled by the clerical regime, could threaten the Persian Gulf region and its vast energy resources, spark nuclear proliferation throughout the Middle East, inject additional volatility into global energy markets, embolden extremists in the region, and destabilize states such as Saudi Arabia and others, provide nuclear technology to radical regimes and terrorists, seek to make good on its threats to eradicate Israel. The threat posed by the Islamic Republic is not only direct Iranian action, but also aggression by proxy. Iran remains the world's most active sponsor, uh, state sponsor of terrorism, proving its reach from Buenos Aires to Baghdad. The prospect of a highly proliferated Middle East or a highly proliferated Northeast Asia obviously uh, would be very uh, troublesome and very difficult. Uh, although uh, when I first came into government from academia, there was a school of thought in the academic world that more nuclear powers could be a stabilizing thing. Uh, Kenneth Waltz wrote a famous piece for IISS about more is better. Um, and I know there was an article that appeared in the American Political Science Review when I was in graduate school suggesting a, a nuclear Middle East could be more stable. It would have the kind of stability that the bipolar nuclear balance uh, had uh, provided uh, during the Cold War. I can tell you now that closing out 30 years in government, I've never met one single practitioner who ever believed that or ever acted as if they believed that. Uh, I think the, the dangers uh, that we would face uh, would be obviously immense. Several new incipient uh, nuclear powers uh, with uh, rudimentary programs uh, would pose, I think, a kind of problem that uh, nuclear strategists in this country first discovered in the early days of nuclear weapons in the 40s and 50s, which is that those programs are extremely vulnerable, which would give all of the countries uh, with those weapons, whether it's Northeast Asia or the Middle East, but particularly in the Middle East, incentives to preempt. And by the way, it would give the United States, I think, incentives to preempt as well. So we don't understand very well how a multiplayer game would work. Um, I don't think all is lost. I agree with Bill that um, diplomacy can be successful, but it will require us to rivet the attention of the international community uh, more effectively than we have on the challenges that Bill described and that I've just tried to describe about what we might face in the future and to use more effectively economic tools that both uh, North Korea and Iran have been subject to and which have gotten their attention, which is uh, basically the, the tools that our colleagues in the Treasury Department have de been deploying uh, with regard to financial sanctions. So uh, let me stop there because I want to be mindful of, of Chet's uh, hook. Um, I'm about to get the hook in government. I don't want to do it on this panel in public, but. I, I will be happy to address some of the other issues in, in concert with my fellow panelists and, and questions. Thank you, Eric, and thank you very much for respecting the hook and for reminding us that occasionally, theoretically, academics can be wrong. Uh, but that's not in practice, just in theory. Bob, uh, over to you. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Perry, it's uh, great to see you again. It's, it, it is an honor for me to serve on your panel. Uh, Dick and Chet, thank you uh, for the opportunity to participate in this very impressive gathering and to the extent I can contribute to the ongoing transition. I was very much involved in the transition eight years ago and am a veteran of many previous ones and having been on both sides, incoming and outgoing, I can say that it is certainly better to be on the incoming team. However, I can also say without any reservation and based on very recent experience that there are real advantages to not being on either side this time around. But I'd emphasize on a serious note that 
whether you're in or out of government, it is important uh, to support the new president uh, in his efforts to deal with what many experts believe are historic problems and challenges facing the United States, both with regard to the economy and with regard to threats to our national security, which are as complex as they are dangerous. And it's in this spirit that I'd like to offer a few thoughts. I've been asked to talk about the U.S.-Russian relationship, uh, particularly uh, as uh, that relationship affects areas of nuclear policy and proliferation. And given the time limit, I can uh, only touch on a few points, so I will be selective and probably risk oversimplification, but we'll try to give a flavor of where I see the relationship today and the alternative paths that that relationship might take. To some extent, what we do will shape Russia's perceptions and policy choices. However, Russia's future course lies clearly with the decisions that Moscow will take, and these decisions may be driven by internal dynamics that we neither recognize nor influence. Let me begin with what I see as the fundamentals. I believe that there clearly are both challenges and opportunities for cooperation in our bilateral relationship in these areas. But the starting point is Russia's view of the world and of the United States. The current leaders in Moscow with substantial popular support and at least until recently with very expensive oil paying the bills, are seeking to reestablish Russia as a great power. Not in my view to recreate the Soviet empire, but to exercise national power and prestige across the globe. This is not in itself a bad thing or a threat to US interests. Russia is a great power with a great culture, with a great people, and it has global interests. It deserves to be treated with respect as a country with a great past and a potential for a great future. The problem lies elsewhere in growing authoritarianism at home and increasingly aggressive behavior abroad. Specifically, Russian leaders say publicly that the United States is the number one threat, seeing us as the principal source of their national humiliation in the 1990s and perhaps the greatest impediment to their goals. They seem to view interactions with the United States from a zero-sum perspective. If we win, they lose. If they win, we lose. And I don't believe that this calculus will change with the change in the White House. With this as background, let me just then turn to uh, several of the more prominent challenges and opportunities. First, the challenges. Uh, many believe that Moscow already has begun to test the incoming administration, its resolve and its mettle. The timing of the Kremlin statements on rejecting the third missile defense site in Europe is not an accident. Coming on the heels of the invasion of Georgia, threatening U.S. allies who have agreed to host the radar and the interceptors is a direct challenge to the United States. On missile defense, the issue for Moscow, at least I believe, is more about moving even a small number of U.S. forces east than about undermining Russia's strategic deterrent. It is also going back to the zero-sum analogy, how Moscow sees its opportunity to win at U.S. expense. For us, this is about a real emerging missile threat from Iran, something that few dispute. For Russia, it is about having the U.S. abandon a capability that is intended to serve the purpose of ensuring the indivisibility of our security commitments to friends and allies. Pressuring U.S. friends and allies is part of it, something that has happened repeatedly. And if the, UN, if the U.S. gives in, Russia will pocket the concession and move on, I believe taking away the wrong lesson. My sense is that we must resist the temptation of a grand gesture to Moscow, perhaps in the context of an offensive arms control treaty that Moscow very much wants, independent of the, of the missile defense issue. To abandon missile defense in the face of Russian pressure would only whet the appetite for other concessions and raise questions about the credibility of the U.S. extended deterrent. Working with Russia on Iran is another major challenge and has been for the past five years. I am convinced that Moscow does not want a nuclear armed Iran. At the same time, it sees itself as having important strategic and commercial interests with Iran. 
These interests, and to some extent the desire to deny the United States a diplomatic victory, have motivated Moscow to use its position in the P5 plus 1 dialogue and in the UN Security Council to block any truly effective sanctions on the regime in Tehran. While the Bush administration has, has sought through very creative means, such as in the field of international finances, to work with other willing countries to impose costs on Iran consistent with but outside of UN Security Council resolution, resolutions, these measures have not been effective in imposing the type of costs that compel or convince Tehran to change course on its nuclear program. My assessment is that without direct and intrusive sanctions imposed through the Security Council, Iran will continue to expand its enrichment program. And this, of course, takes Russian agreement. I hope the new team will find a way to achieve this outcome before Iran acquires the nuclear weapons capability it seeks. Today, we are losing that race. And if we fail on Iran, we fail big time on our broader nonproliferation policies and posture. Let me move quickly to areas of cooperation of which two stand out as vitally important. First, working together on combating nuclear terrorism, and second, working to ensure that the expansion of nuclear energy is done in a way that best reduces the risks of proliferation. Although we have a very long way to go, I think progress in the area of combating nuclear terrorism has been substantial. It is reflected in years of joint work in the context of non Luger and other DOE and state prevention programs. More directly and more recently, it has resulted from the joint leadership of the U.S. and Russian Global Initiative to Combat Nuclear Terrorism, first announced by Presidents Bush and Putin in 2006. This effort, built on the PSI model, now has the involvement of over 70 countries around the world and encompasses a broad spectrum of actions from prevention to protection to response, including in the areas of detection and consequence management. And Russia has been a very good partner, and I know that it wants to continue this work. I'm also confident the new administration will do likewise, as both President-elect uh, Obama, uh, like President Bush, uh, has indicated that nuclear terrorism is the preeminent threat that we face as a nation. I know Dan will talk about nuclear energy, so I will just say that in 2007, the U.S. and Russia announced a second joint initiative, an initiative that is designed to discourage the spread of enrichment and reprocessing technologies while allowing for the expansion and facilitating the expansion of nuclear energy. The withdrawal of the 1-2-3 agreement as a consequence of Russia's actions in Georgia uh, does uh, present a setback, but I still believe that this is an area that it could be very productive for U.S.-Russian cooperation. And you'll note that both of these initiatives, both in the nuclear terrorism area and the nuclear energy uh, area, uh, provide for cooperation where our interests intersect where we both believe that our national interests are critically involved. And it's on this basis that, that I think we can build confidence over time uh, across other areas and produce something that I know is all of our goal, and that is a better, normal, and lasting relationship with Russia that serves the interests of both of our countries. Let me stop there. Thank you, Chet. Thank you, Bob. Dan. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Chet. Uh, thank you, Secretary Perry and Dick Solomon and the Institute of Peace. This is a, a terrific uh, opportunity to uh, emphasize the continuity and the in interest of uh, promoting nuclear stability around the world, and I'm delighted to participate. Secretary Perry uh, and uh, Bob and Eric were very eloquent in talking about a nuclear tipping point. Uh, this is, I think we all agree, a real threat even now. And I want to drill down on that issue. But I'd like to talk for a moment about a different tipping point. This is not often done in uh, Washington where climate issues tend to be stovepiped from uh, nuclear weapons issues. But uh, as we say, we're no longer calling them stovepipes. They're really cylinders of excellence. So uh, a report by NASA last month indicated that two trillion tons of land ice in Greenland, the Arctic, Antarctica, and Alaska have melted since 2003. And NASA scientists concluded that the Earth is edging extremely close to the tipping point of climate change, at which point the oceans will rise, jungles will become deserts, deserts will become jungles, and uh, life as we know it will be unalterably, potentially catastrophically changed. 
Now, an MIT study in 2003 said that if we wish to make a dent in greenhouse gas emissions that could possibly avert this catastrophe, we would need a substantial expansion of nuclear energy on the order of a tripling of the existing fleet of about 400 reactors, in other words, about 1,000 gigawatts of nuclear power by mid-century, simply to keep nuclear as 16 percent of global electricity supplies. Regardless of what the United States decides, and I don't think it's clear what we will do on nuclear energy, the world is proceeding on that premise. Today, 36 reactors are being built in 12 countries. Each of these reactors needs fuel. The processes to produce the fuel for nuclear reactors, as I think everyone here knows, can also be used to create nuclear weapons. The spent fuel that comes out of the reactors can also be used to create nuclear weapons from plutonium. If the expansion of nuclear power is accompanied in a linear fashion by an expansion of plants that will produce enriched uranium and plutonium, we will exponentially increase the risk of nuclear terrorism that I agree with Secretary Perry is the gravest risk we all face. In other words, in an effort to avoid the catastrophic tipping point on the climate, we may actually inadvertently precipitate the nuclear tipping point in weapons proliferation. So what is to be done? We need a system in place to prevent, in my judgment, the untrammeled expansion of enrichment and reprocessing facilities. This is not easy. In today's environment, it will not happen at the point of a gun. It will not be compelled. Unfortunately, if you ask people to give up the right to enrich and reprocess, they will say no, and they have done so in large numbers. What's the alternative? Well, here's the other stovepipe. Don't talk to the arms controllers. Talk to the electrical utilities. Talk to the people who need to bring fresh water to populations. Say to all those countries, the utilities and energy ministers who want nuclear power, they can get cradle-to-grave services for all those fuel requirements by signing up to a regime that will provide exactly that, effectively a leasing regime that would give them nuclear fuel, they would burn in their reactors and would be taken away when it's done. This will not be easy either. You're going to have to satisfy a number of concerns. Will these provisions of supplies be reliable? You're going to have to have multiple guarantees, commercial guarantees, national guarantees, international guarantees backed by the International Atomic Energy Agency. It's going to have to be economical, and I think it's perfectly defensible for something that could save us from world catastrophe in two dimensions to have something that says, you'll get a carbon credit if you do this, or something of, of that character. We've talked more about it. You have to avoid the third rail of political discrimination. And in that respect, I would say keep your so-called rights under the Non-Proliferation Treaty to build civil nuclear technology, but just sign a non-compete clause. For 10 years, you won't need enrichment and reprocessing. Proliferation is all about time, as Joe and I have said time and again. We could work in that direction. We have to persuade people they're not giving up scientific benefits. So you have an international collaboration. It's already started under the Bush administration called Global Nuclear uh, energy partnership. There are ways to deal with that problem. Now, I want to be clear, and I'll wrap up here in a minute. This is not a panacea. This is based on the premise that most of the entities that want nuclear energy want it for production of electricity. That is not merely a stalking horse for nuclear power. This will not solve the Iran problem or the North Korea problem. However, it may isolate those problems because if the whole world goes for a regime which is consensual in avoiding a cataclysmic development of enrichment and reprocessing, it will put a sharp light of scrutiny and international pressure on the outliers. And I think that's what we need. My final point, 
not only for me on the panel, but for us collectively, time is of the essence. If we don't fix this problem soon, the facilities will get built and it will be too late. So I would close in citing the eloquent words that Bill Perry cited of uh, one of his predecessors. We do have a choice between catastrophe and cooperation, and I hope we choose the latter. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. <clears throat> Wendy, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, first, thank you to USIP. Uh, I join everyone up here, and I'm sure the audience as well, in celebrating 25 years of peace building, and thank you, Dick, for including me this morning. Uh, I also want to thank Bill Perry. One of the great honors in my life was when then Secretary of State Madeleine Albright asked me as counselor to work with Bill Perry on North Korea, and uh, it was a very tough and remains a very tough problem but it was a singular joy uh, to get to know Dr. Perry, and he is definitely one of my heroes. Uh, third, I'm really here in my own capacity today. The substantive work of the transition is complete. Uh, I am no longer a transition official, otherwise I wouldn't be here this morning. Uh, and if anything, I'm here this morning speaking as a commissioner of the study that Eric mentioned, World at Risk, uh, which was chaired by former Senator Bob Graham and former Senator Jim Talent and is about the prevention of weapons of mass destruction, proliferation, and terrorism. Uh, as part of that review, uh, we traveled to Moscow, to Vienna, to London. Uh, we were also on our way to Islamabad. Uh, we stopped down in Kuwait City, about to take the plane onto Islamabad only to have our blackberries buzz endlessly, to look up at the television screen, which is ubiquitous in every airport, and to see the hotel that we were about to stay in in about eight hours uh, in uh, flames, uh, because we were on our way to the Marriott Hotel, and had we been eight hours earlier, we would have been standing in the lobby at the time of that explosion. Uh, if there is ever a way to remind you, as Bill described his own experiences, of reminding you of the risks and the terror that we all might face, uh, that was a reminder to all of us. That said, I actually believe we have an enormous opportunity, and the fact that a bipartisan commission came to such strong recommendations, many in support of the words that Dr. Perry laid out this morning, is a testament to the great opportunity that we do have here today. Uh, I think we have heard directly from the President-elect during the campaign, and I know we will hear from him in the days ahead, about the importance of this issue. And as Eric mentioned, as Bob mentioned, uh, this is shared across party lines, that the greatest threat uh, is the hands of a nuclear weapon, uh, uh, the, of a nuclear weapon in the hands of a terrorist. And although that is probably not an enormous risk statistically, the results would be truly catastrophic. Uh, so what do we have ahead of us, and what is this great opportunity? In 2009, the START Treaty expires uh, with uh, Russia, and uh, the Bush administration has begun that renegotiation. The Obama administration needs to carry it on, and to use that as an opportunity to continue the tremendous cooperation we have had with Moscow in the past for cooperative threat reduction, uh, for the reduction of nuclear weapons in the world. Uh, although there are many stresses and strains in that relationship, this is an area of strong partnership and opportunity. Uh, second, in 2010, we have the NPT, the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty Review Conference. Uh, this will be a very tough go, a multilateral effort if there ever was one, a need for enormous leadership uh, from the White House, from the Department of State, from the Department of Defense, and everybody else we can think of, track one and track two and three and four, uh, to really accomplish a number of recommendations that are made by the Commission. One, uh, that we look at imposing a range of penalties for NPT violations and withdrawal from the NPT that shifts to the burden on the state as opposed to the other way around. That we create access to a nuclear fuel cycle for everyone, for those who agree not to develop their own capabilities and are in full compliance with the NPT, which would help uh, in the area that Dan spoke of. Third, that we strengthen the International Atomic Energy Agency, 
which is really struggling to do the job it has, and it has a much greater job to do in the future. That we continue to strengthen counterproliferation initiatives, both those that are part of treaties and regimes, and those like PSI, the Proliferation Security Initiative, and the Global Initiative to Combat Nuclear Terrorism that Bob mentioned. That we all commit to no new states, including Iran and North Korea, that must eliminate their nuclear weapons ambitions. Third, fifth, sixth, that we promote and maintain a moratorium on nuclear testing, and personally, I believe, move uh, towards the ratification of the CTBT. That we work together uh, for agreements uh, that will really make real uh, Resolution 1540. Uh, that we continue to work on cooperative threat reduction programs, and as has been articulated very eloquently by others on this panel, work with all of our might to get Iran to step back from the precipice that will truly be catastrophic. And they would get North Korea not only to disable but to dismantle its nuclear weapons capability and to get rid of its nuclear weapons. There is an enormous agenda ahead, but I believe that there is an enormous opportunity that is evidenced by the agreement that you hear, even though there are many areas in which we disagree up here on this panel. I want to caution us all, though, that the baton that is being passed today will not, with the Obama administration, instantly become a magic wand. Change is really coming, and it needs to. But it will take very, very hard work from everyone in the world to make real this opportunity. There are miles to go until we all sleep, and we don't want that sleep to come because of a nuclear nightmare. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Wendy. Thanks to all the panel for being as uh, respectful of the hook as you have been. And it leaves me as, uh, as chair the opportunity to put one question before the panel, which I will do before our time expires. And that question is this. <clears throat> Can the US modernize its nuclear forces without adding fuel to the fire of nuclear proliferation? And if so, how? How do we respond to countries that rely on us for extended deterrence on the one hand, but also want to see us take the leadership role on nonproliferation issues? This is an issue which I, I think, Bill, your commission has, has wrestled with, and I just uh, would like to put it before any member of our panel who would like to address it, starting with Bill, if you'd like to, or others who might, among the younger generation of security specialists to my left. Why don't we start to the left? OK, we'll start to the left. Anybody like to step up on that one? We're starting with me. I defer to Dr. Perry. Uh, I, I think that the study that uh, uh, Bill is uh, chairing is quite crucial to figure out this balance. Uh, I know that there is a lot of debate and discussion, for instance, about whether the CTBT should go forward without a resolution of the reliable replacement warhead, and that it is quite crucial uh, that we maintain our deterrence as uh, for the president-elect has said, while uh, we move toward a goal of a world uh, that is not threatened in the way we are uh, by nuclear proliferation. Uh, and I think achieving that balance is tough, uh, which is why I'm very glad that Dr. Perry is chairing a study that may help us find that very delicate and difficult balance. But I note that even with that study, uh, Bill spoke today about the importance of moving forward with CTBT uh, in conjunction with resolving this issue. Uh, and I think it is very important that uh, many people argue that CTBT should not go forward because it may not go into force, not enough countries have ratified it. In fact, I think it is incumbent upon the United States to provide the leadership that moves us in that direction, that creates the norms that are so crucial for the vision that Bill outlined at the beginning of this panel. Chet, just briefly, I would recall when, uh, when we struggled in the earlier Clinton administration to extend the 
nuclear nonproliferation treaty, which, which would have expired, would have been lost had we not succeeded in that effort. A bipartisan report of the Council on Foreign Relations, chaired by Steve Hadley at the time, concluded that one of our most effective nonproliferation instruments was the reassurance the United States extended to its treaty allies in Europe and Japan. So I believe that reassurance remains fundamental to our nonproliferation strategy and why we don't worry about proliferation in dozens of countries that we used to worry about in the 60s if you read your history books. That having been said, I also agree with uh, uh, Secretary Perry and uh, Wendy Sherman with respect to the positive effect comprehensive test ban treaty could have on our nonproliferation efforts. And as uh, Dr. Perry uh, discussed in his uh, description of the, the Four Horsemen editorials, the role of reducing numbers of nuclear weapons as ipso facto nonproliferation. So how do you... Just because Russia and China and even our friends, the UK and France are modernizing, but we need to modernize because nuclear weapons continue to play an important role in our defense and deterrent posture. Both our own deterrent in a very uncertain world involving new threats like North Korea and Iran as well as uh, guaranteeing or, or, or providing a hedge against the future in other, in other situations. But also, and I think very critically so, as others have mentioned, in terms of the assurance, the assurance that's provided by extended deterrence. And if we don't maintain an effective and reliable and credible and safe nuclear posture over time, we will lose the confidence of our friends and allies. And if we do lose the, the confidence of our friends and allies in our nuclear deterrent umbrella, then they will be tempted and I believe they will begin to pursue their own nuclear capabilities and result perhaps in that cascade that others have spoken about. Thank you. I guess it's, it's left for me to be on the very far right. So, um, I, First, I agree with m most of what our colleagues on the panel have said. I, I would actually rephrase the question, Chet. I don't think it's a question of can we modernize and, and also do what we have to do to uh, move forward as with the difficult task that Wendy described at the NPT RevCon, I, I don't think it's a question of can we, it's we have to. I don't think we have any alternative. Uh, in particular because, uh, as I mentioned, the near nuclear uh, Iran is almost as big a challenge for us as one that has actually tested a nuclear weapon, particularly with the rapid development of their ballistic missile program. The uh, ability that that program will uh, play as a stand-in for a tested nuclear weapon in their ability to coerce or compel uh, allies in the region and beyond to do things uh, will be a huge challenge for the next administration. So I think we absolutely need uh, to have, uh, as the um, uh, Perry Commission uh, has said, a, a safe, uh, uh, secure, and credible uh, nuclear stockpile uh, in order to underpin our, our deterrent. Whether you believe in zero or not, everybody, I think, agrees that you must have a capable nuclear deterrent to get to zero. Uh, and so there's no real dispute, I don't think, about that. Uh, I would also just add one other point, which is I think we have to, in the extended deterrence realm, think not only of the nuclear weapons, which will be a part of that equation, and there will be a tension between the desire to um, go down in numbers, and I think I, I don't want to speak for other members of the panel. I would say probably most of us believe we can go down from the 1700 to 2200 range in the Moscow Treaty. Um, but I think uh, there will be a tension between how far you go down and your ability to, to uh, make the nuclear umbrella credible to allies in Northeast Asia and in the Middle East. And we need to be thinking about conventional capabilities as well, in particular uh, regional ballistic missile defense, which our colleagues at CENTCOM have been engaged in uh, in, a, in a very serious way, uh, and which we've been engaged in with our allies in Japan in a very serious way over the last few years, that will also be an incredibly important part of this equation. Thank you. <coughs> Bill, how did the younger generation do? <clears throat> now, as I said in my talk, I believe that we will be have to maintain deterrence for the foreseeable future, and that means we'll have to have some form of modernization of this force. The question is, can we affect that modernization without damaging our goals of, of, of uh, heading towards a, 
world free of nu nuclear weapons and without damaging our nonproliferation goals? I think the answer is yes. It's both a technical and a political answer. The technical answer is, is because of the great success we've had in the stockpile stewardship program, I believe we can have successful life extension programs for many decades to come. Uh, that's a technical answer. The political answer is that if the United States assumes a leadership in this role again, in particular, uh, by taking action like ratifying the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, just tell the world that we are back on a track of actually providing leadership and leading the world towards a reduction of emphasis on nuclear weapons, that will go a long way as well. Thank you. Please join me in thanking Secretary Perry and all members of our panel. Thank you.